Hello there, you 5.5 million awakening wonders. Thanks for joining me on this voyage towards truth. I had a fantastic conversation on my podcast, Under the Skin, available from Luminary, with the brilliant Professor Brian Cox. Loads of you will know him from Rogan Show, all sorts of stuff. He's on tour at the moment. You should check him out. There's probably a link in the description somewhere because we want to promote this guy because he's a brilliant educator and a brilliant person. We had a tentative conversation about scientific objectivity and the necessity for transparency and open discourse. We were very careful in the conversation and I certainly wouldn't want to frame Brian Cox's words in any way that was detrimental to his actual perspectives because that would be taking him out of context and that's not what we do. But what I was asking about is when science and power meet, how can we trust the objectivity of science. When discourse and discussion and conversation get shut down, how can we trust the objectivity of science? Brian is a science purist. He says science should be undertaken with humility. It's a process of inquiry. It's a constantly shifting process with ever-changing narratives. Me and Brian disagree on countless things. Brian is basically an atheist. I believe in God. There are so many ways we see things differently, but where we 100% agree is that human beings should be looking for ways to come together, optimistically and respectfully approaching the world and world one another, looking for new ways that we might organize society and reflect power. This part of the conversation is absolutely fantastic. You are going to love it. Stay with it right to the end because you don't want to miss anything that might change your life. Hit me up in the comments below with your questions and inquiries. If you don't subscribe already, subscribe right now and stay to the end so you can sign up for my mailing list in case I ever need to speak to you beyond the confines of this particular platform. See you in a minute. You're going to love this conversation. You know when art or music, and I suppose in your case, science, and in my case, because sometimes like watching your stuff or Neil deGrasse Tyson's or, you know, like um, you know, Carl Sagan and stuff, you, like when you're taken to that point of absolute wonder, when you think, oh my God, I actually can't hold that in my head anymore. You know, and like that could happen though in a beautiful animation or a beautiful piece of music where you're taken to that place, like that's sort of beyond me, and you feel, uh, yeah, that numinism. You feel that sense of this is beyond my faculties to know this, but I feel something greater. Whether that is, you know, and however you want to define that is, you know, of course, that this place, this place, this precipice that can be reached through art and through just observation, really observation and expression of the beauty of our reality. It has become increasingly excluded, I feel, from our cultural and social life. And I feel, Brian, that you and, you know, some of the other, you, let's just talk about you, you don't seem to me typical of, you know, not that there's a, it's not really a crowded field, is it? Sort of a science entertainer, communicators. I mean, there's not loads of you really out there. But, but, but generally speaking, you know that there's this, this, you'll be familiar with the term scientism. You'll be familiar, of course, with a type of scientific understanding that's used to underwrite certainty. You'll be familiar too that it recently, politically, scientific understanding has been, is, mm, to some degree, necessarily been used to underwrite policy. You know, when it comes to conversations about gender, when it comes to the conversation about governments mandating stuff, can you see sometimes when it comes to the field of chemistry and pharmacology and the sort of the irresponsibly, you know, irresponsibility, and I, and I think we're on legally safe territory when we say with the opioid crisis, that science is occasionally a subset of corporatism. Science is occasionally a subset of power. Science is sometimes a subset of politics vis-a-vis -vis gender conversations and sexuality conversations. How do you retain your own purity? How do you retain your own, presum presumably, your, your own disgust? In the same way as that I would be disgusted with anyone using religion as a way of reaching, uh, uh, being dogmatic, certain, condemnatory. How do you manage the misuse, I would call it, of science? And, you know, be as specific as you want, obviously. Well, I mean, a very good example is, is the pandemic, um, because what you saw there was science in action in real time in a very serious situation. So if you go back, you know, three years, then there, we don't know anything about this virus at all. I, I, it, it may have been in some animal reservoir, you know, in bats or something. We, we really, we didn't know about it. We had no knowledge about this virus. And then we discover it. And then we start to do science in order to understand it, understand how it transmits, develop vaccines and so on. 
So what you saw there was real-time research. And I think that many people and politicians are just in general, not scientists, they're just people, right? They, they, they didn't know, that they, they misunderstood that process. It's very easy in politics uh, to say, well, you, we heard it, right? This is the science. We are following the science. As if there is a, a little book that you can open and, it's, and there's a list of things and it says, right, do this. This is what you should do. You should wear masks in enclosed spaces or you should do this and that and, and so on. When actually what was happening was people were doing research and then finding out that, okay, so is this thing airborne or not? We didn't know actually initially. Does it spread mainly in droplets? Does it spread on surfaces? Does it? Do... So, so as you find out more about the thing, then the advice changes, and that that's where I think that there can be a problem because that that word the advice changes. A lot of people, I think, tend to think that if advice changes, then the previous advice was wrong. It was it was it undermines the authority of the people that gave the advice. That's not the case in science. It's not that we, we the, the best way to look at science is that we never claim that we're right, right? All we're saying is that this is the best snapshot of our opinion at some time, and it will change. And then on top of that, you're right. The undercurrent of your question is that people who are disingenuous, who are not practicing what we've been speaking about, which is humility, and just trying to understand the nature and understand a new thing, be it a pandemic disease or the evolution of the universe, that disingenuous people can just take the one piece of advice that backs up their prejudice and then use it vocally in order to justify their actions. And that's where it goes wrong. So it's not it all goes back to this that this you've we've got to understand that science is not a belief system right it, it, it's not um we're not scientists don't sit on a mountain passing down stone tablets to the, <laughs> the people at the bottom saying this is this is it as i just said you know go back to what i said about Feynman and Oppenheimer science mm. is a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance and so i think the problems occur that they can occur sometimes the scientists can you know it's very hard i have great respect for the scientists that were working during the pandemic you know the public facing scientists because they're not people necessarily who understand the nuance of communicating with the public right they, they don't, they're scientists and so they're likely to say well at the moment um we don't know everything but we know this and so we think you should do this but then they might not even say, because it's kind of obvious to them that actually we might discover something tomorrow and then we're going to say you should do the other thing. Right? So, so it's very, very, very difficult, especially in a serious situation like a pandemic, to, um, to, to communicate that. It's, it's, I'll just, it's an argument for science education, actually, yeah. because, because you, you need to, from, from being a child, from, yeah. from very young, you, if you can just understand that this is contingent knowledge, it's constantly evolving, it, you can't be told what to do, right? Mm. Science is not going to tell you what to do um, b because with certainty, because we might <laughs> we, we'll find something else out tomorrow. But that I said it before, it's the point is it's the method we have of acquiring reliable knowledge. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Isn't Brian Cox an absolutely fascinating and brilliant orator? Isn't it good to see conversations between people that see things differently? Isn't it absolutely necessary to have these kind of discussions in the public sphere? What did I miss? Hit me up in the comments below. What would you have liked to have seen me ask? If you enjoyed the conversation, go over to Luminary. If you're not a subscriber, you should consider subscribing. Me and Brian have a fantastic conversation. I think it's our second or third one that we've had there. I've had Neil deGrasse Tyson on. I've had everyone on that podcast. It's a fantastic podcast. It's an education in itself. It certainly has been for me and I hope it will be for you. Let me know in the comments below what you want to see more of. If you don't subscribe yet, subscribe right now. Hit that mailing list right now. Click on that. Click on that. Have a look at this video and this video if you've not seen them already. But more importantly than any of that stuff, please stay free.